This week on Quadriga, Eastern Enlargement, Big EU, Big Success. On May 1st, 2004, the EU welcomed 10 new countries into the fold, the Mediterranean island states Cyprus and Malta, as well as eight former East Bloc nations. For the new countries, EU membership promised economic growth and prosperity. But membership also brought challenges. Many countries experienced large-scale outflow of skilled labor and had to implement costly regulations on farming and industry. The old EU member states feared an influx of cheap labor could undercut wages. What's the picture now, 10 years after EU enlargement? And does the EU have a solution for the growing popularity of Eurosceptic right-wing populist parties? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Ten years later, can we still view EU enlargement as a great success? That's what we want to talk about today with three people who follow events in Eastern Europe very closely. And it's my pleasure to welcome Katarzyna Stokboza. She works at the University of Southern Denmark. She's of Polish origin and she previously headed the Central and Eastern European Department at the German Council on Foreign Relations. A very warm welcome to you. And Judy Dempsey is with us. She's Senior Associate at Carnegie Europe and also Editor-in-Chief of Strategic Europe. As a journalist for the Financial Times, she reported from Eastern Europe and Germany and headed the paper's Jerusalem Bureau. She's a regular contributor as well to the International New York Times. And finally, my pleasure to welcome Michael Stürmer. He is Senior Correspondent at the German Daily Die Welt. He's a renowned historian and has taught in Germany, the U.S., Canada, and at several European universities. And for many years, he served as political advisor to the German Chancellery. Very warm welcome to you as well. Until recently, Eastern enlargement has been seen as one of the EU's biggest successes. But Judy Dempsey, can we still regard it in that light, given what is taking place now in Ukraine? Yes, even more so. Um, of course, there's going scepticism about enlargement, but the EU enlargement has actually, contrary to what some believe, given the, the new member states, that the, big, the number that joined in 2004, they have given them a kind of psychological, political and economic security. Without enlargement, they would have been in very, very bad shape during this Ukraine crisis. Michel Sturmer, there is, of course, um, widespread acknowledgement now that NATO's eastern expansion was problematic and perhaps also a true provocation to Russia. Can we see the EU's eastern enlargement in an analogous light? No, it's slightly different, but not entirely different. We used to think for the first 10 years after the end of the Cold War that EU enlargement, it's not expansion, it's enlargement. Uh, that EU enlargement would be uh, acceptable to everybody, not only those countries that pay, but also those countries who are being excluded or who have to stay outside. Uh, meanwhile, we've understood with the help of uh, Mr. Putin in the Kremlin that uh, we have uh, uh, gone too close for Russian, for the Russian taste, too close to Russia to the lion, to the bear's den, um, and we have to rethink the reality in, in, the, in, the, in the theory of international law, the Ukrainians and all other neighbors of Russia can do what they want. In practice, this is uh, a little dangerous, and even uh, the EU uh, sort of intervenes massively in uh, those in the lives of countries that want to join. We are making prescriptions, sometimes they are being followed, like in Poland, sometimes they are not ignored, like in Romania or Bulgaria. Uh, so we do change the shape of things, and we do it because we are on the good side of history, and the others are on the poor and losing side of history, so we feel we are justified, but we have to be a little more careful. Katarzyna Stokwosa, let's get that Polish perspective. It's your country, of course, that's often meant when people say NATO, Eastern expansion was problematic. NATO, East, NATO Eastern enlargement, you're absolutely right. We try to avoid that expansion word. Um, <laughs> 
that NATO Eastern enlargement was a problem because it pushed into Poland and that that had at least indirectly been promised to Russia that that would not happen. In terms of the EU's Eastern enlargement, would you say that people in Poland viewed that very much as an either or choice? We are choosing the West and turning our back on Russia on the East. In Polish case, I would say definitely yes. The Eastern enlargement was successful and the majority of the population says uh, yes, we have decided to be a part of Western European cultures and uh, values and uh, we took this decision after breakdown of the common use of the Socialist Bloc uh, 89 and behind this decision were consequences as well, consequences uh, uh, shortage, economic shortage and uh, Polish people knew that they have first to give something, give up something and uh, perhaps uh, lose a little bit of economic power to get something uh, some years later. And this is what didn't work in uh, other countries, for example in uh, Hungary or uh, what uh, we can observe now in, in Bulgaria and uh, in Romania. And uh, I very much agree with you that uh, you say yes, that analyzing the crisis now in the Ukraine and what happens between Ukraine and, and Russia, we can mm. say that because of this conflict, we can say that Eastern enlargement was successful because we have achieved like a common plan what we have to do, how do we have to react? There's two points here. Uh, Poland didn't turn their back on the East. This is very, very important. And as soon as, uh, mm. as 25, 25 years today, Poland is celebrating its, 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 libera its liber liberalism from communism. Yeah. And the first strategic decision it made was to reach out to Ukraine, its mortal enemy, mm. even as, as much as Russia. And ever since Poland joined the two th in the EU 2004, it's made a conscious effort to use its EU membership to reach out to Belarus, to reach out to Moldova, to, and above all, to reach out to Russia. And they, they were using its strength in the West as a kind of um, avid, as an avenue not to leave the others behind. It's been a it's been a fantastic strategic choice. It hasn't succeeded because it didn't get enough support from the other EU members. Yes, but why this choice? Do you think perhaps that uh, because Polish state was afraid of the big Russian neighbor? So of course this mm -hmm. is one very important point for the decision to support the Ukraine and Belarus as well. I remember when Professor Geremek, my venerable colleague, was foreign minister. That was the time when the real decisions were made. In and Geremek okay. and Geremek uh, made it a very strong point that there had to be a uh, an opening to Russia that uh, he, he was very much aware of the fact that uh, we should be very careful to uh, sort of turn the face of Russia towards Asia. Um, and I don't think we followed enough of that kind of enlightened Polish mm -hmm. approach. Yeah. Mm. You're right. Yeah, I just want, I'll, take, I'll pick up one thing, the ambiguity of the Polish membership, because mm. Poland, uh, I mean, is, it's a, it's a middle-sized member of the EU now with mm. enormous influence. And um, it's interesting, Russia, uh, Russia, I, my interpretation that Russia wants Belarus and Ukraine particularly as their buffer zone mm. against the democratization and the s civil society of the EU, whereas Poland actually wants Belarus and uh, Ukraine inside the EU yeah. as their kind of buffer zone except, uh, uh, against Russia. So in that sense, there's a very interesting competitive mm. game going on, yeah. which is not entirely um, appreciated inside the EU, but I think the Polish strategic uh, goals were set out very early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, and this is uh, what is uh, many times forgotten in Western Europe, and uh, when they present like the Polish point of view and why Poland supports Belarus and the Ukraine, and this is not only because of democratic values and because of solidarity, but this is because of this strategic geographical meaning of uh, mm -hmm. a position, Polish position. 
relation between East and West and uh, because uh, Pol Poland is afraid um, of the Russian big neighbor. Let me um, take us uh, to a somewhat uh, related but also different point. When we're asking ourselves, is Eastern enlargement the success that it is often said to be? One of the arguments often made by proponents is, look, it has helped the countries of Eastern Europe democratize. It has kept them on a path of peace and democracy. Yet, Michel Sturmer, when we look ahead to the EU elections pending at the end of May, we are hearing predictions that we are going to see the biggest returns to far-right, Eurosceptic, and xenophobic parties ever in EU history. So is this also a claim with which we need to, uh, that we need to view with somewhat more skepticism? I think uh, the skepticism has to be taken very seriously indeed. And the, it, the, the future of the EU is not only about enlargement. It may well be about falling apart when you think about Britain. I think it would be a big disaster if Britain were to leave uh, the EU uh, as a result of that pending referendum, that possible referendum, uh, in the next few years. So that is a real concern, and that's a very big concern for this country, because it, within the EU, we, ha we, ha we don't share the same philosophy. We, the Germans share the same economic, liberal, neoliberal philosophy with the Brits, but not with France, let alone Italy and, and the rest of the southern rim. Um, but but so, actually, the Brits would, would not mind if the EU were simply to become a free trade zone and not much more, whereas Germany has pushed for deeper integration. Well, we are now having second thoughts. Yes. I remember and that at the time when we in the, uh, worked in the Chancellor's office, we never specifically pointed out what kind of ever closer union we meant. It wouldn't have been very wise because it would have opened uh, a, a kind of contradiction between the French and the Germans and a lot of others. We didn't mean the same thing. And now we are having uh, the financial, the euro crisis. The euro has divided Europe instead of uniting Europe. We have um, big problems because the euro and the banking union can only be saved by ever closer integration and while the majority of the people says enough is enough we don't want the commission to intervene in our bathrooms bedrooms living rooms everywhere day and night 24 hours seven days a week we don't want that we don't want in germany to live without our beloved federalism and we don't want to live under a kind of centralized uh, anonymous bureaucracy overpaid uh, and over here so, uh, so there there are countervailing uh, so let me ask, forces let me ask uh, judy uh, you of course uh, with a great knowledge of britain would you say that the possibility that britain could vote to leave the EU, that this does reflect a kind of backlash related to a too strong, too, uh, Brussels too strong and also too much meddling and also perhaps to the fact that the EU project was pushed too far too fast. It is surprising that Britain ever agreed to join the EU, frankly, because this Euroscepticism <laughs> really runs so deep. I mean, it was a Conservative government, Prime Minister Edward Heath, who brought Britain into the EU. It was a fantastically radical revolutionary decision. And now there's, there's um, huge amounts of, of uh, skepticism. It's, it runs deep. It's reached a height now for two reasons. It's not the bureaucracy in the EU. This is totally exaggerated in the tabloids. It's the lack of a leadership by the Labour Party and the Tory party, especially the, the Conservative government, about the benefits of Europe. This is the first thing. And secondly, the, the, Brits, the British, or rather the English, the Scots are a different matter and the Welsh are a different matter. The English don't understand, and European leaders except Angela Merkel tells them privately, they don't understand that their place has to be in Europe because America is not going to remain interested in Europe. Third point, Europe, Europe's foreign policy and security policy is nothing without the British component. And British armed forces and defence. Absolutely defense, true. Uh, and, and just one thing: now with the huge cutbacks in the British armed forces, the British 
military cannot do it alone anymore. The old days are over. And the, the, the English public and the English media particularly must embrace this idea of a Europeanness. We are nothing without Britain and this Europe is so weak in view of the weakness of the transatlantic relationship. And Melinda, it's not only, it's not only the referendum that may go one way or yes. the other. UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, will probably make it uh, impossible for the Tories to win outright majorities. Okay, let us now talk about that right-wing element, which, as I said, we may see uh, seeing very significant returns in the upcoming EU elections. Katarzyna Stockwosa, perhaps uh, many of us remember the famous Polish plumber discussion. <laughs> oh, the yeah. idea that after Eastern enlargement, suddenly Western European countries would be flooded with Polish laborers like Polish plumbers looking no, for work. Melina, if you really need a plumber, <laughs> Polish, Bulgarian, God knows, from the moon, you are very grateful yes. when he comes and <laughs> saves <laughs> and yeah. on time saves <laughs> and saves your day or night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Big we... fear out there <laughs> of hugely enlarged immigration as a result of Easter enlargement. Has it come to pass? Did people flood out of Poland mm. after they were able to do so after 2004? Yes and no. Um, yes, Polish people and... Uh, not so many Czech people, but uh, later on Bulgarian, Romanian people, he started to emigrate. And uh, this is very difficult, a uh, very important point uh, for Eastern enlargement. A new immigration and a new labor market and uh, working migration is something that happens until today. And it's something that's a d very important point of a daily life in Europe, in the whole Europe. You did but, <laughs> I did, yes, but it's different. Uh, uh, now we have to um, uh, distinct, distinct between uh, um, migration of uh, qualified people, non qualified people, because why? Uh, because after migration started, or perhaps before the migration started, first, first appeared, and uh, above all, how this first and propaganda mm. was presented in uh, Western European yeah. media and uh, in um, German uh, newspapers and German television, they started to present new migration, big migration movements of people who want to, uh, yes, uh, take uh, away jobs from, from the other Germans and uh, other Western Europe, and it didn't happen, yes. And, uh, Five years later, when we analyze the numbers above all from a border region, this is very important because this first appeared above all in the border region where this uh, direct migration started to develop and uh, where the Polish plums started to move to the German side of uh, the German-Polish border. And what these numbers showed us that the reality was different that uh, imagination and uh, first in the media. So it was a little bit like a propaganda, but this propaganda less until today. Oh, yeah. And uh, today we can compare this uh, um, perspective, this analysis, mm -hmm. referring Bulgarian and uh, Romanian. Let, let me just throw a few numbers out there. I know you want to address that point, uh, Judy, but here's a few numbers. 1.6 million Romanians left Romania. That is 7.2% of the population. That's a significant yeah. number. 1.3 million Poles, that's about 3.4% of Poles. The big question, of course, though, is, first of all, where are they yeah. going? Mm -hmm. What kind of jobs yes. are they taking? Are they displacing workers? And then also, are they eventually returning to their okay. home countries? What do we know about that, Judy? Um, very interesting. Um, first of all, because of the special, I don't want to uh, make it so technical, uh, there was a ban on, on the Poles and the Hungarians and the Czechs coming to Germany after seven years, uh, up to seven years after the, uh, the EU um, enlargement. Now, these, these workers, they, they were skilled and unskilled. Uh, students, students, students. This, this was the, this was the mecca Europe. This was the freedom to travel, the freedom to work, enshrined in, in the in the in the four movement, the free movements of the EU. They went to my country. I'm Irish. I'm, I emigrated. Um, they went to Sweden. It's shares. fantastic. Yeah. They went to Sweden. They went to Great Britain. They went to Belgium. They went to France. 
France discovered the real quality of plumbers and they went to Ireland <laughs> and of course Scandinavia and generally until recently they were met with open arms yeah. not only did they fill a huge uh, labor shortage but they reinvigorated the schools and the universities and a way of life they brought a way of life a kind of cultural identity which was eroding in parts of Ireland especially in the church actually and in, and in, in Britain the other a very important point, remittances. They sent the money home. And either they saved in Britain, and maybe they bought uh, apartments, but they sent the money home for education, for apartments, to build up their own kind of little nest. And this is always forgotten. And despite what UKIP says, this awful far-right-wing party in, in Great Britain, the, the Polish contribution to the economy has been enormous. But so what accounts for the disconnect, Michal Sturmer? If, if the picture is as positive as we've just heard from Judy, why do we have far-right parties all of, over Europe claiming that immigrants are stealing jobs, that they are a terrible threat, and that the EU essentially is undermining economies? Um... People feel alienated from where they are. It's a, it's a, it's a alienation. It's psychology much more than economy. Hard, it's not hard facts of sociology, labor movement. In most cases, I think if you are in trouble and you need a plumber, you don't ask uh, many questions, but you put him to work wherever it's needed. Um, it's uh, also the result of many, many years, in fact, decades, of national politicians blaming the EU for things. The EU needs to be blamed for many things, but not for everything. And it was a, a common feature of German politics that uh, we pitied ourselves to be the uh, chief treasurer of the EU, and something built up. And then, of course, in Germany, but in particular, uh, the, we have in our historical tradition, but also after 1945 or 1949, we have a fairly uh, balanced domestic system of running, running politics, running business. And here, the uh, EU uh, bureaucracy, uh, the Eurocrats were seen to get involved in the most ridiculous detail. And that gave a bad name. Also, Whether the bananas can be bent more than a certain cares? angle. Who cares? Um, and all kinds of meddling, as you said, was seen. And then, of course, 10 years ago, when uh, Bulgaria and Romania, they joined a little later, but Bulgaria and Romania were visibly unprepared and why they joined or why they were admitted had to do with balancing Germany against France and France against Germany and the South against North. It was a cynical game. And then people discovered, well, we have uninvited guests and we don't want that. It has gone too far, too fast. And this is a revolt. There is no sensitivity in Brussels that history matters, culture matters. It's all ticking off certain statistics. Mm -hmm. Katarzyna. And there's another important question, whether we have a really well-developed migration policy in Europe. And this is very different. And um, you're right that this uh, first have to do with uh, pictures, with something imagined, with stereotypes and uh, prejudices. And uh, now let us analyze a little bit this migration policy. And it's very different and different in Britain. And what you presented is exactly the perspective that Polish media and Polish people have from uh, British media and, um, yes, British analysts. And uh, this is what the Polish people really like this uh, positive way of presenting Polish migration in the Great Britain. It's very different in Germany. In Germany, even qualified migration isn't presented uh, well enough. It's like, okay, we have this... Uh, uh, foreign professors and um, scholars at our universities, so and so many percent. But it's, for example, different from northern European countries. In Sweden, in um, Finland and uh, Denmark, they are proud 
because they have so and so many foreign uh, students and professor they presented really like with proud okay we have more than 50 percent of qualified migration from this and this and this countries it's really very very different in europe and uh, this is what i miss sometime referring to germany uh, can i i think um the migration is is an issue but i would see the migration not involving the EU members, but how we're going to deal with the Middle East, which is far more critical. But there's another aspect which I think the EU's been very slow to recognise, and it's the inability, particularly of Romania and Bulgaria, to absorb the structural funds. And people, the young people are leaving. There's a brain drain because of the lack of opportunities, the pervasive corruption, and the kind of wasted time in making the system more flexible to keep the people at home. And I think this is a huge problem, that some of the problems are homegrown. And yeah. the, the Bulgarian Romania has been absolutely far too slow in recognizing that this brain drain, the people I'd will like not go to, back. I'd yes. like to talk a bit about the effect of enlargement on the eastern countries and start out by asking you, Michal Sturma, Judy just mentioned, mentioned um, inability to absorb structural funds, but also some people would say inability to absorb the kind of, or to, to practice the kind of political changes that were expected, particularly in the case of the late coming Eastern member countries. Now, again, as I said, we often say, look, this prospect of becoming EU members, that put them on the path of democracy. It helped them to start changing their legal systems. But how far have those changes really gone? Are Bulgaria and Romania full-fledged members of the democratic community as we expect them to be? They are not. They are not, and democracy isn't just about going to vote every four or five years. Democracy needs a lot of infrastructure. And I don't mean bureaucratic infrastructure, I mean a state of law, reliability of courts, transparency, open discussion. Um, so it is this whole setup, uh, the institutional setup and the mentalities of people. And John the Twenty Third, this venerable new saint, mm -hmm. in his day said, uh, you have to give time to time. Uh, the politicians and also the bureaucrats, especially the commissioners, there's one commissioner who has no other uh, responsibility than to admit new countries, whether they are fully fit, half fit or not fit at all. Uh, if you do that, uh, you are creating trouble and uh, you bring in all kinds of misfits. Uh, and uh, it's not there was not enough time. If you want to change mentalities, and democracies are about mentality fundamentally, you either need a very long tradition like in Britain, uh, or you need a shocking experience, a traumatic experience like in Germany, and then it will work. But it, it takes time, it takes decades. It doesn't take so, months, it doesn't take two or three years. It so, takes decades, and we didn't give ourselves the time. Katarzyna Stokwosa, a devil's advocate, might say then in the end, Eastern enlargement practiced too quickly, pushed too quickly, actually dilutes the EU's own standards and that we have seen it embracing countries that lag very badly on corruption or if we take a look even at Hungary, which was one of yep. the first uh, Eastern countries uh, to be admitted, hardly convincing on democracy at the moment. Completely agree, and uh, a very good analysis of uh, Michel Stürmer. Um, but uh, I don't believe in different mentalities. Uh, mentalities are equal, but different traditions and customs. Perhaps something that you well, live your your daily. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. But don't you think that uh, these results you have presented, and I completely agree, Romania and Bulgaria are not prepared. But this is perhaps non, not only their fault. This is perhaps also our European fault because we didn't express our expectations enough, what we expect. Yes, and uh, we expected, of course, not only economic changes, but political changes and uh, changes referring to uh, large corruption and so on and so on. But there were like a little bit of uh, taboos and political correctness. Yeah. We didn't express our wishes and expectations enough. Um, uh, two points on this. Um, actually, now that the, the, the fault of the EU was that once you're in, the pressure is lifted. 
But in fact, in the case of Romania and Bulgaria, actually the pressure has consistently increased on them to actually improve judiciary uh, transparency. This is a good thing. The index uh, 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 towards corruption, it's, it's reducing. It's a good thing. They would have been far... <sighs> They would have been far worse out than in. I would make one point. This is not the first enlargement. Remember Spain and Portugal after dictatorships and Greece? Imagine had they not been brought in. This was the marvellous um, this was the marvellous lever, the marvellous um, change for these countries Greece that pushed them. To... I, I want to go back to Greece in a second, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was after the military coup. But, I mean, it's remarkable the changes that were made to Spain and Portugal. By bringing them in, the dictatorship was shaken off. There's, of course, a big difference with the communism, because communism was so totalitarian was and, 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 you know, and invasive. The, the Spanish model, yeah. what happened in Spain, was copied exactly in, uh, in Poland, because yeah. Spain was so successful. Yes, yes. Uh, and they did the big bang, yeah. yes. You see, there is an architectural problem. Uh, when the wall came down, it was obvious, at least for the German parliamentarians and for the German government in the early 1990s, something would have to be done. We could not just sit there and watch what, watch what would happen. Something had to be done. Poor neighborhoods had to be brought in, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Um, and then, a concept was developed called the Schäuble Lama's paper. And that asked for variable geometry. It asked for a core group of EU experienced, well to do, homogeneous uh, countries, which would guide the others, but with very long periods of acclimatization. It was not Fold, sitting on the fence and folding our arms and doing nothing. It was about an active course, but tailor-made for every each and every country. So what happened to that? What happened to that? It was put off the table by Chancellor Kohl because he said it would be far too complicated. And then we stumbled into widening and more widening uh, whether this was justified or less justified, or countries were well prepared or ill prepared or not prepared at all. Uh, Greece is a wonderful example. Um, and on top of all this, we also put the euro currency with the great illusion that everybody would be happy to join. The most important, financially speaking, the most important country is Britain, and Britain has not. Uh, joined and will not join in any foreseeable future. So I think we got ourselves into a, in, into a political mess. Political there mess nothing, is... There was nothing between heaven and hell. Hell was outside the EU, heaven was inside and, the EU, and this while is, we should have had a kind purgatory. of... This uh, is the kind of ground. this is the kind of situation in which uh, political scientists and economics uh, economists like to talk about the second best. There was no first best. We went with second best, uh, and we got a mess. <laughs> Katarzyna Stokosa, I'd like to again ask about the countries themselves, starting with your country, Poland. How would people in Poland be living if there had been no Eastern enlargement? Again, second best. Uh, it may not be the ideal, but how have lives changed in a way that they, they how would they be different? Um, yes, the things changed a lot. Yes, politically, in the economically, in the, in the countries, in the countryside, too. yes. So I would say in Eastern Poland, um, I compared a little bit of development in Western Poland. This is a well-developed uh, part of, uh, of Poland because of uh, the big, uh, important, strong uh, German neighbor. And uh, in Eastern part of Poland, um, underdeveloped uh, Polish uh, countryside with uh, another big neighbor but uh, not so perhaps strong, but not economically strong, uh, a Russian one and uh, Ukrainian one and uh, Belarusian one. But what was different from Bulgaria and uh, Romania was that um, different programs, structures programs, were introduced immediately after Eastern enlargement. Education programs started to develop. Um, German and uh, English uh, languages programs. So it's like uh, everything was prepared for the enlargement, and people really wished this enlargement. And people 
were ready to pay something for mm. this, to mm. pay economic price, to make first transformation process, and knowing that 10 years later, mm. they will get something better and they will profit from this enlargement. This, I, I think that enlargement was prepared from psychological point of yes. view. Okay, uh, s slightly different from what I meant though. In a, in a way, let me ask Judy as well, because I know you've just come back from Estonia, yes. I believe. Yes. Um, how would you say lives on the ground, the man on the street, how has his life changed in a way that it, it, it wouldn't have been if, he ha if the country hadn't been admitted? They would have been highly vulnerable for a start. Uh, firstly, and secondly, there would have been an enormous pressure on them uh, by Russia. I mean, there is a, a Russian minority living in Estonia, but the Estonians, what is interesting about the Estonians, and it was, it was wonderful being up there and having time to talk to normal Estoni uh, Estonians, they, they are a small country that need the EU. And for them, the EU represents a very special kind of freedom and independence, and above all, of coming home. People forget... I identity, but they have preserved their identity in, in many, the, the language and, and in many aspects of, of, of how they eat, very fascinating cuisine, and how they dress. But it, it, it's the idea of that very special independence and coming home, which, by the way, joining nature was very special for them as well. This is the first thing. Secondly, I flew from Tallinn to Frankfurt on the way back to Berlin. The plane was full of young uh, Estonians going to work in Stuttgart or southern Germany, highly skilled, going home at the weekends or going to visit. The mobility, the flexibility, they've taken it on board and they're very, they, they feel they have a certain confidence we've made it. Now, one last point. Uh, the, uh, curiously, the small states. Uh, uh, the small state, states that joined in 2004 are very pro, but the Czech Republic doesn't defend the EU enough. Well, we've got in now, and now we can... They don't pull the, they don't pull the weight. Migration isn't so strong. Like and that, also yeah. the, political, the political debate and, and some other issues. Let me now ask us to turn to the future, because uh, we don't have too much uh, more time left in our program. The question for me when I hear that, coming home, culture, who's a European? How much further does it go, Michael Stürmer? If I look at the EU treaties, the EU is defined as based on freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. Who still needs to be in that club, and where does it stop? Well, <laughs> history never ends, history never stops. Um, there will be new challenges and people will get used to it. This, this is a generational project. This isn't a project for a quick fix, uh, ticked off somewhere in Brussels' uh, back rooms. Uh, it's a generational pro project and it will, uh, it will be very beneficial and hopefully uh, this will yield also some piecemeal solutions for problems uh, at the eastern rim of the EU. The, this is completely unsettled. This is pretty dangerous. It may the explode into The current solution is Eastern Partnership, that of course, Eastern Association, this is what we were offering to Ukraine. Will Ukraine, for example, should it be a full-fledged member of the EU at some point in the future? Not, not in the foreseeable future. Ukraine is completely unprepared. Ukraine is, let it be said, so far a failed state. Uh, for a number of reasons, from emigration to corrupt elites. Uh, but you, there, there, there is no base to build on. The EU is a very ambitious project. Mm -hmm. And if you liked uh, Romania and Bulgaria, you will love uh, Ukraine or white Russia. No, no, these, these are, this is pie in the sky for a very long time. Katarzyna Stokwosa, Balkans, Turkey, if we do not give a prospect of admission to these countries, do we wind up creating a permanent zone of insecurity and vulnerability on Europe's eastern flank? What would be very important is to create a zones of cooperation, stronger cooperation and uh, communication and exchange. Including uh, Russia? Including Russia, Good. of course. It's, it's very important. It's yeah. important to communicate about our values and what is like our common European basis and our expectations 
to the others to become a part of Europe. And uh, if they are not able and not willing, there are other possibilities. In the whole discussion about Ukraine, of course, Judy Dempsey, uh, in the West there's been a lot of self-flagellation about the fact that we didn't do a better job of presenting this as uh, an and rather than an either or situation in terms of Ukraine, Europe and Russia. Um, do you think that a true cooperation with Russia and EU in this eastern area, including Ukraine, is truly possible? Would Russia want it? Russia will pick and choose and what Russia, the Kremlin, this leadership doesn't want is the contagion of the EU values and there's a complete rejection of the human rights and of the civil society and of our way of life, of, of, of a kind of post-modernity. This Kremlin, the, the, the leadership in Russia does not want this. We can't have that kind of relationship. What we can have and what we must have is the right to travel. We must have the young people get the scholarships to work, to see how your functions. This is not an either or. You've got to keep the door open, otherwise we will be building a new Berlin Wall way to the east of the EU. Michael Stürmer, very short, if you would please, looking again toward the future, do we need a bigger, younger EU to c compete with rising powers like China? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, the, the, a very important question is the role of Russia in all of this. Uh, Putin, I think, is gaining land and people, but he is losing the future. He's losing mo modernization, which Russia badly needs. Russia is overaged. It's, Russia is in a bad state. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us today. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon. <laughs>